Welcome to the Center for Israel Education's ongoing weekly analyses of the Hamas-Israel war. I'm Ken Stein, the president of the Center for Israel Education and Emory University Emeritus Professor of Contemporary Middle Eastern History, Political Science, and Israel Studies. Please note that all our past webinars are on our website, israeled.org. There are audio and viewing versions of each. This is the 19th webinar on the current war, focusing on four distinctive Israeli communities, the Druze, Arab Muslims, Maronite Christians, and Haredi Jews. We chose to include the Haredi community because of the distinctive relationship with the state of Israel. On our homepage is the summary of minorities in Israel. Anyone who's viewing this can get a deeper understanding of Israel's minorities and the relationship of the minorities to the state of Israel. To assist us in reviewing these groups, we have four fine guests. Shadi Halul, the chairman of the Israel Christian Maronite Association, Tali Farkash, a Ynet newspaper journalist and a Haredi social activist, Dr. Arik Rodnitsky, a researcher from the Israel Democracy Institute's Arab Society Israel program, and Dr. Scott Abramson, the Center for Israel Education Senior Research Officer. We established the center in 2008 to respond to student, adult, and educator inquiries on Israel's story, Zionist background, Israel place in the Middle East. People of all ages sought reliable sources based on data facts and sources. We've tried to provide that over the last 15 years. Please do support our work if you're inclined. If you've benefited from this webinar or other materials, please go to the donate page at israeled.org. When Israel was established in 1948, some 22% of the population in the Jewish state were not Jewish. In 48, the Israel Declaration of Independence noted that in the midst of wanton aggression, we yet call upon Arab inheritance of the state to return to the ways of peace and play their part in the development of the state with full and equal citizenship and the representation in all of its bodies and institutions, provisional or permanent. Israel's track record was up and down from 1948, but today its minorities have pretty much full citizenship throughout the country. 75 years later, the percentage of the population of Israel that is not Jewish remains about 21 to 22 percent. According to most recent figures, approximately 17 percent of okay. the entire citizenry are Arabs. In this, we exclude Arab residents in East Jerusalem. The Druze in Israel are not quite 2 percent of the population. They're a community of 150,000. They live in three major concentrations, one on Mount Carmel, south of Haifa, the other in the Galilee, mostly the Upper Galilee, and the other on the Golan Heights, where they're dispersed between four villages. The Christian community, in total 2%, it's altogether non-Jews, I call them, are about 24%, and Jews 76%. In terms of the Haredi population, what number would you give that as the percentage of the total population of the state of Israel today? 12%. So 1.2 and something million people. Israel's diversity is reflected in a range of responses to four months of war since Hamas killed 1,200 people and took 240 hostages on October 7th. Amid many examples, areas in which some Israeli Arabs rioted during Israeli Hamas fighting in 2021, they've been notably quiet. And Haredi altered Orthodox Jews have volunteered in higher than normal numbers for military service. Muslims, Bedouins, and Druze were murdered by Hamas terrorists on October 7th, as were Jews and foreign nationals. Hamas and other Palestinians did not discriminate. They killed anyone who was in support of the state of Israel. I'm going to ask each of our guests to give us some idea of the minority group that you're speaking about today, but their relationship was to the state of Israel in the months and maybe years prior to October 7th. And what actually has changed, if there is anything significant? Arik, what was the most significant change in the Israeli Arab community, if you can make a generalization? When we talk about the Muslim community, we need to bear in mind that this is the majority in the 
Arab minority accounting for approximately 85% of the total Arab population in Israel. To describe what has changed, we need to go back a couple of years relating mainly to political development on the partisan landscape in the Arab sector and its relationship with the Jewish state establishment. Mansour Abbas, leader of the United Arab List, which represents the Islamic movement, which is one of the largest popular social, religious, and political grassroots organization in the Arab sector, joined the government just 48 hours after the ending of the previous bloody cycle between Israel and Hamas that took place in May 21. So I think that by joining the government, the Islamic movement, the Muslim community signaled to the state that it is interested in more integration into the social and political fabric of the state. Of course, the picture is multifaceted, but if something is new here in the wake of the October 7 events is that these events caught the Arab minority and especially the Muslims within the Arab minority with a complete surprise and shock. Is this the face of Islam that we know? Is this all the Palestinian problem is all about? Now, this leads to a contradictory or different orientation within the Muslim community based on several public opinion polls and what I can sense from my talks to my Arab Muslim friends and colleagues. The one is the desire to be integrated more into the Israeli political landscape. And I believe that if early election will be called the day after this war ends, I would not be surprised at all if we see the United Arab East representing the Islamic movement in Israel joining once again the government coalition. The second is frustration because of the suffering of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip who are all Muslims. And here we go to the sense of a shared or imagined community or the sense of mutual solidarity between Muslims on both sides of the Green Line. It is quite clear for the Muslim minority or the Muslim community that what happened on October 7 has nothing to do with the true face of Islam. I would like to start with presenting what is the Maronite community and the Christian native community of Israel. Syriac, Aramaic descendants of the early Christians who used to live in this region and still live in this region, used to speak Aramaic language and switched to speaking Arabic under Islamic Arab conquest to the Middle East since the seventh century. And that's the development, that's in fact the development of the Middle East seventh century of Islam conquering the fertile crescent and imposing Arabization and Islamization into the region. And those people who survived were our communities and some Jews in this region who kept speaking Hebrew or ancient Hebrew or Aramaic language like us. And within time, they start speaking Arabic language because this was the only official language for the land. So these are the native Christians of Israel, of the land of Israel, who we belong to, and to the churches that we belong to, the Syriac Maronite Church of Antioch. This is our church. We are based in Lebanon and in the high Lebanese mountains, where we were isolated for many years, and here in the northern Galilee. And in Israel, we count 2% of the population, about 181,000 Christian natives, to the land. It's like Jews in the U.S., 2% of the entire population. Here we are Christians, 2% of the entire population. So we live here in peace, in secure environment. We enjoy freedom before October 7th, and we still enjoying this security and freedom because we have security forces protecting our borders from all we have in the troubling Middle East and from ISIS and from other Islamic jihadi groups that threatening not only the Jews, but also other minorities like Yazidis, like Christians in Iraq and Aramaic Syriac people in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Israel too. So thank God we have Israel and we don't have those groups here invading those lands 
And this is only due to our IDF military forces who are protecting the borders in this front. Our community in October 7th, it was affected in a way, it depends where you are. If I talk about the macro, it is the same fear that all Israeli citizens have. No difference with Jews. I can tell you that most Christian community in the land of Israel, in the state of Israel, in October 7th, they felt the same feeling like Jews. The same fears, the same ambiguous destiny. They didn't know what the future is hiding for them. That was the feeling, like any Jew, they felt very scared from what might happen if this jihadi Hamas ISIS group continue with its success in the southern borders. And we were afraid from another attack in the northern border from Hezbollah. Majority of us live in the Galilee, which is much closer to Lebanon. We were fearing invasion from Lebanon and Syria, as they call it, the unification of fronts in Iranian orchestrating this ring of fire around Israel, unification of front from Syria and from Lebanon and from Iraq, the Shia axis group, radical groups. That's the fear, like all other Israeli, like all our Jewish brothers and sisters who live here in this land. We are also Israeli, and they look at us as Israeli. It doesn't matter what's your background. We also have this feeling that if Jews will not exist here, we as Christians will not be able to survive here in this land. We have no privilege, if I can say that, like the other privilege that, for example, Muslim majority of other minority in Israel, which is about 18% of the state of Israel, might have this privilege. Maybe if those radical Islamic groups come here, they will give them the option, hey, you are Muslims like us, maybe you can join us, or if you don't want to join us, you will be punished and attacked like all other people. In my case, I don't have this privilege. I'm the same like Jew. So I have this feeling that we need more unity inside the state of Israel. We need to stay away from those terrorists and unite with the Jews to defend Israel. That's the feeling that we felt and many people were calling me because I'm the project manager of recruitment of Christians in the IDF. That's my job in reserve because I'm a paratrooper officer. So I'm doing in reserve today this recruitment for Christians to the IDF. And many were calling me, hey, help us. We want to join the IDF now. That's the feeling we had inside our community. And here, where I live in the north of the specific Maronite community in Jish, in Gush Khalaf, I had even a much greater solidarity feeling for the state of Israel, with the state of Israel. And many wanted also to join and were fearing that invasion is coming from the north, from Hezbollah, and something needs to be done immediately to protect ourselves and protect our state. Tali, let me ask about the Haredim. It's a pretty large population in the state of Israel. It has a weight that is often felt in a negative way by most Israelis or a high percentage of Israelis who feel themselves to be secular. As you said, it's a very large community in Israel. We are talking about 12% of the population in Israel belong to the Haredi community. So it's become in recent years more seen and more engagement with the general population in Israel. We can say about 25 years, more or less, we are seeing processing of engagement and more connections between the Haredi community and the majority population in Israel. We can see it in various fields, for example, more technology, more higher education in the academic field. We can see also in military service, but in much less percentage. We can see changing, cultural changing of the lifestyle of the Haredi community in Israel. It's a very conservative community with a high range of uh, poverty, but still we can see, for example, more change of how people are doing their free time, vacations, going abroad, all sorts of stuff that's more similar 
of what we are seeing in the general population in Israel. This is part of ongoing inner discussion inside the community between the forces that uh, want to move forward with more connections with the general population in Israel and the forces that want more conservative, more isolation, want to keep the enclave community behind the metaphorical walls and keep what we have for the years that community was established since 48 in Israel. So all this is a general background to understand this ongoing conflict between how to engage and how to be separate. It's something that's always in the background of what we are going to see since October 7th. We can see the volunteers that came and do a lot of things. Some of them was pretty hard collecting body parts from the fields of the kibbutzim around the, the Gaza Strip, even digging graves, doing horrible things. Some of them even need emotional support after what they done. One of the head of one of the mm. organizations that called Zaka actually collapsed in the middle of this ongoing volunteering task. So this is what we see from one hand. People that came forward collecting stuff, food and supplies and all of that, we see it also in larger scales. But in the other end, we can also see people that saw this movement with fear and think that maybe this kind of interactions can lead to more engagement and more connection between the Haredi community and the majority in Israel. People need to understand that the basic principle of the Haredi community is to keep the younger generation inside the religion and inside the rules of the halakha, of the Jewish law. This is the core principle. So any engagement with more liberal, more secular culture, it's something that can be a threat to what they want for their children. In one hand, they want to be in front and they want to help and they want to engage. And the other hand, they always fear that it can put their children and the younger generation in risk of living the religious life and become a secular. So this is something that's very common in religious societies all over the world. We can see it also in the United States. We would say that the community is churning and it's churning because it's not quite certain what this end will be. Is it notable that you've been able to identify not just people volunteering, but actually wanting to serve in the army. More people are putting up their hands. More leaders of the community are saying, isn't it time for us to do this more? Or is that just not yet happened? No, it's not yet happened. In my opinion, it's not going to happen. I don't see how they can send the teenagers into the IDF and engage with secular people. So it's becoming more and more difficult because after October 7th, we know we need more soldiers. It's a fact. The community, they don't know what to do. Scott, tell us a little bit about the Jewish community that you've studied and their role since 48 uh, or even before. And what impact do you think uh, October 7th may or may not have had upon that relatively small community? October 7th, made nonsense of many assumptions, long-held assumptions, some of which had been able to crystallize almost into orthodoxies. Chief among these mistaken assumptions was the notion that Hamas, a jihadist death cult, had as its priority the governance of Gaza and the export of textiles and produce and managing all the other responsibilities of a conventional government. Of course, we saw that assumption explode on October 7th. We also saw the assumption explode that Israeli society was unbridgeably riven, such that a civil war even threatened with po different political factions broadly those supporting the judicial overhaul and those opposing it, readying for fratricide against one another. 
Another assumption was that American Jewry and Israeli Jewry are divorced. That too proved to be false. But as far as the Druze are concerned, another assumption that was exposed as hollow was that the Druze, starting in 2017, had become increasingly and even irreversibly alienated from the state. And that's because in 2017, the communist law was passed, empowering the government to issue demolition orders for unlicensed structures and crews and other villages without obtaining a court order first. That had the effect of embittering Drew's popular sentiment against the state. Then in 2018, insult was added to injury when the basic law was passed, which many Drews saw as a gratuitous insult because it didn't speak of equality between Jews and anyone else. It, in fact, referred to the unique right of Jews' self-determination. But the enactment of the Basic Law provoked widespread demonstrations across the country in which the Druze participated significantly, particularly in Tel Aviv. The third irritant in recent Israeli-Druze relations took place last summer when the government suspended, after an outcry in the Druze community, plans to install wind turbines on the Golan Heights in and around Druze communities. This is contested, but the Druze affected claim that it was expropriation. The Israeli government and the company that was contracted to build the turbines claimed that they had proper authorization to do it. In any case, what we've seen on October 7th is that despite these burgeoning resentments of the past few years, Druze patriotism is as keenly felt and as deeply held as ever. And there's been an outpouring of sympathy from the Druze community, even though no Druze were in fact killed on October 7th, for the simple reason that the southernmost of Israel's 19 Druze community is 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. So the minority that was affected most adversely by October 7th was the Bedouins for the simple reason of proximity as opposed to Druze remoteness. But there is a single Druze family in the Gaza envelope in a community called Moshav Yated. And that family of six acted very heroically on October 7th. First of all, the patriarch of the family, despite having a broken leg and a cast, joined the Moshav's standby squad and helped repulse the terrorists. His wife did something even more valuable. She was able to dupe one of the terrorists into thinking that she was on his side. And having won his confidence, she was able to extract sensitive information from him that she then relayed to the Karakal Battalion that showed up on the scene and was able to use that information to great advantage. And so she's been lauded as a hero. Is your impression about the Druze community like Shadi's impression about the Maronites, that after October 7th, they felt more of an identity to their Israel citizenship, even if they had issues previous to October 7th, that they felt a measure of fear that had been inflicted upon Israel in general, and they felt that they had to identify with the state, even if they didn't agree with the state on many issues? I agree with that assessment, absolutely. All right, Mansour Abbas, as an example, we know that there are other elements within the Arab community that would not have seen eye to eye with him when he joined the government after the last conflict between Hamas and Israel. What would you say about that element within the Arab community of Israel in the aftermath of October 7th? Are they more or less inclined to adhere to their Arab-Palestinian identity? More or less inclined to put their hand up and say, we have to have our Israeli citizenship because it will protect us? This is one of the most complicated questions. I believe that the sense of mutual fate with their Jewish brethren to the Israeli citizenship has increased. The following slide is based on a recent 
poll by the IBI. This is a large sample of the Arab community, 538 respondents, Muslim, Druze, and Christians. We asked them to what extent do you feel part of Israel and its problems? And the data was collected approximately two months after October 7. And these are the results. And you see the difference between the regular average in the period before October 7th and in the most recent poll of November. And you see the different, I would say, feelings and the different orientations within the Arab community where you see the breakdown according to religious groups. Now you see that the Druze community feel the strongest mutual fate with the state, while the Muslim community, to a lower extent, they feel that they are part of the country and its problems. But I think that if we compare this to what we saw in the period before October 7, there is a strong sense of a willing to take advantage of the Israeli citizenship. Does this necessarily contradict the Palestinian national sentiment? No, it does not. And this depends on how would you define Palestinian national sentiment? Is this a national liberation movement or is this more of a cultural sentiment based on a mutual past and heritage and social values? I, I just add- want to add about the Christian community before October 7th. We had some type of statistics among them and asking in different towns in the Galilee, all the way to Haifa as well, if they are satisfied with life in Israel or not. Many of the people complain about some issues and nobody can deny that there are some issues. But uh, after all their complaints, we asked them one question. It was the last question. If you stay in your own homes, your own lands, your own villages, would you prefer having a Jewish regime controlling your state or an Arab control of your state? And the answer was 99% they would prefer Jewish sovereignty on this land. Would you say the same thing if you use the word Muslim instead of Arab? Well, for me, Arab Muslim is the same. I differentiate between Christian and Arab. So Arabic speaking Christian is not an Arab. It's only a language of communication. His ethnic background is from Syriac Aramaic in majority of this region of the Levant. Tali, there is a lot of anger, animus, disagreement with the Haredi community in two items, particularly. One is that they are seeking continued exemption from serving in the army. And then the other is their inability or unwillingness to not only pay taxes, but to take from the annual budget because of the size of their families. Is there any notion in your mind that what happened on October 7th can narrow that disagreement or animus or with some people just total disgust? I would like first to refer a question about the influence of the Haredi community in the political arena. I think it's very crucial to understand it. The influence of the Haredi community on the political issues in Israel are major, not because their size, but because they are crucial part of establishing a government in Israel today. In the current political situation that we have right now in Israel, you cannot establish a government without the Haredi community. There was an attempt to do so, and it failed. Because right now, if both sides of the political arena, the left side and the right side, cannot join forces and have a combined leadership, you simply cannot let the Haredi parties go to the opposition. So in this condition, 
of course they have a lot of power and they use it to secure what they see is necessary to their community. I disagree largely in some of these discussions and decisions, but this is the way the political in Israel are working. A crucial to understand that the key to solve this issue with the Haredi community lies on the hands of the secular people in Israel, the, the society of the majority. When they decide that it's more crucial to address the issue of the military service, to address the issue of the economic participation and the work and all of that, all the educational issues, everything. If they decided that this is more important to the future of Israel, they need to lay down their differences and hold hands and do what is necessary to do. Because I don't see any scenario that the Haredi community are willing to leave what they think it's right and what they think is necessary to their survival as a community. It was too many years that the government in Israel and it came from the right and it came from the left. It doesn't matter. Give them the permission to do whatever they want in order to keep their political interests. So they need to decide differently. All right. The Israeli Arabs, after October 7th, what was the attitude that you've been able to ascertain of their affinity for a two-state solution? This is one of my interests as a scholar. What is the relationship between the Arabs in Israel, generally speaking, as a minority, and the Palestinian problem? Now, we see, according to various polls, that while in the past, one or two years ago, the Palestinian problem did not gain so much prominence as an acute problem for the Arab minority, today it is more acute, of course, more acute are day-to-day -day problems such as crime and violence and building and planning and higher education and the like, but the Palestinian problem is suddenly back on the table. And also we see that the issue of a two-state solution has returned to some extent to the political agenda in a sense that while in the past the Arabs in Israel raised the slogan of peace and equality, meaning peace, two-state solution and equality within Israel, in the period following the Oslo Accords, in the passing three decades, we see a split between these two goals, meaning that the question of peace used to be taken care of in the other side of the Green Line and the issue of equality was dealt with by Arab parties and civil society organizations. For now, the question of peace and the two-state solution return to the table in a sense that for the Arabs in Israel, the concern for their Palestinian brethren, again, I'm speaking generally on the political mainstream in the Arab sector, not necessarily on Christian and Jews, but on the political mainstream, the concern is so high, higher than before. So this is why they once again raise the flag for calling a peace settlement based on the two-state solution in order to safeguard the lives of the Palestinian brethren in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Is it fair to say that Israeli Arabs would not want to sacrifice their Israeli citizenship to join that state? In one word, no. In two words, not at all. We have to go back to the middle of the century by Donald Trump and the reaction of the Arab minority that we are here to stay and we are voting for the Knesset elections, so we would certainly not give up on our citizenship. Scott, what's your two-minute summary, my friend? The response to October 7th has shown that minority identification with the state is much stronger than was previously thought. We see this in the fact that the supposedly disaffected or alienated Druze have been seized by patriotism since October 7. 
We've seen this from the Christian community, which Shadi described. We've seen this to a lesser extent, but still to a noticeable degree from Arab Muslims who, as Arik said, consider what was done on October 7th a disgrace to Islam or an offense against Islam. And many Arab Muslims, indeed the majority, do not support what Hamas did on October 7th. As far as the Haradim are concerned, I don't follow that community so closely, but my sense is that many people have been surprised by the degree to which the Haredim have identified with the state and have seen their destiny as intertwined with the states. I want to thank the four of you. I'm sorry we couldn't spend a lot more time with each of you by going to our website. You can access any of our past webinars. And if you enjoyed or benefited from today and you want to support our work on providing quality learning materials and content on modern Israel, please go to the donate page. We succeed and we live by the goodwill and the donations of people like you.